Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, very um, quick presentation here on AGNs. AGN is abbreviation for Active Galactic Nuclei. And um, this is a really big kind of unifying idea in astronomy, and this is like one of those satisfying things that happens in science every now and then where um, over the years you get a lot of different pieces of evidence, and then um, at first it looks like things are really complicated, and then you find some underlying unifying principle, and everything kind of makes sense. And it's, um, you know, we love it in science when you can explain many phenomena with one idea, you know, kind of like all of chemistry gets explained by the periodic table or, you know, just protons, neutrons, electrons, that kind of thing. So let me walk you through uh, the confusing landscape and then the unifying principle. So it all starts uh, back in the early days of um, galaxy observations. Uh, in the 1950s, they started finding that some of these galaxies um, were just really loud, basically. They, they, you know, they started looking outside of the visible spectrum and doing a lot of radio astronomy. And of course, this is where a lot of modern astronomy is happening now, is outside of the visible spectrum. And we'll talk a lot more about that in a few weeks. Um, but when they first started doing this work, they, they were super surprised to find that some of these um, galaxies uh, were emitting an enormous amount of energy uh, more in the radiation in the radio uh, end of the spectrum. So most stars, individual stars, when you look at them, right, they're peaking out in the visible. And yeah, like the sun and other stars are emitting radio waves too, but not as much as they are, say, blue light, red light, and all that kind of stuff. So this was a big surprise, and they thought they, you know, there must be some new mechanism underlying them. And so they were called quasi-stellar radio sources, right, because they could see there were lots of stars there. They were looking at a galaxy, and that abbreviates to a quasar. And so this is where the, the idea of quasars come from. And they tended to be seen um, only in very distant galaxies. And uh, to, even to this day, we haven't observed uh, any quasars in nearby galaxies, which turned out to be a good thing, as you'll see. Um, and then around the same time, too, they found um, enormous uh, spikes in some of these quasars were so much more energetic. Um, they were uh, higher energy and they were more variable, right? So, um, and so they called them blazars as a, uh, you know, kind of a, a version of a quasar where the, the signal came to seem to come from a smaller source within the galaxy and um, was higher energy and more variable. And so they figured they were related, so they named it something similar, but, um, you know, once again, could not understand it. You know, is it a different mechanism? Is it the same mechanism with something different going on? Also, um, only in the most distant galaxies was this observed. So quasars and blazars. And then uh, a third category, which um, was only related in that it uh, has higher level in the radio frequencies, there were some galaxies that weren't uh, enormously energetic, but they just seem to be emitting a lot more radio frequencies than your typical galaxy. And so um, people weren't sure if it was in the same category or not, but this idea of emitting so much radiation outside of the visible spectrum, um, you know, it's just a big mystery. And honestly, I don't know historically if people were trying to connect these before or if it just came about. Um, but yeah, so you have these three phenomena, which I want you to know, quasars, blazars, and radio galaxies. And so here's the explanation that came about uh, in later in the 20th century. And this came after our understanding of black holes really developed, right? Remember, the first black holes weren't observed until the 1960s, and a lot of physics actually wasn't done around uh, black holes until the 70s and 80s by Hawking and a lot of other uh, really smart guys who were like, you know, working on general relativity and trying to understand the dynamics around black holes. And what uh, we realized and have come to understand is that all three of these, quasars, blazars, and radio galaxies, are actually the same phenomena that we're just looking at in different vantage points, okay? So um, actually, I'll come back to this slide. So let me show you what's at the heart of the matter. At the heart of the matter is a black hole, right? So we believe that most, if not all, galaxies have a supermassive black hole in the middle of them. And uh, the majority of them, like our own supermassive black hole, are just lying there, just quiet. You know, maybe occasionally a dust cloud falls in there or, uh, you know, maybe a star comes by and it rips that star up and eats it or something like that. Um, but um, if there's not matter falling in, you know, it's what we would call an adornment state or something like that. However, if it is uh, sort of in an area with a lot of mass, then as that mass falls in, before it falls over the event horizon and crosses that point of no return, 
it will swirl at increasing and increasing rates. And of course, some matter will actually go into orbit. And basically, it accumulates a whole bunch of junk around it. It's called an, an accretion disk, right? Like it accretes over time. And at the center of the accretion disk, driving it is this black hole. And this is where the energy is coming from in the quasars, blazars, and radio galaxies, right? These are the most energetic uh, sources in the galaxy because you have this really intensive gravitational field, so there's lots of energy there. And the orbital motion of these particles can accelerate the matter to near light speed. And so whenever you have charged particles that are accelerating, they release uh, energy. And since these accretion disks are in a plane, there's a certain geometry associated with it, right? So you can see in the picture here, right, you got the black hole in the middle, which is not pictured. This accretion disk, which looks kind of like a, you know, like a like the flat disk of the solar system or of a spiral galaxy or something like that, but it's much tighter, right? This is an accretion disk within the radius of the solar system. Um, and this matter here uh, is outside of the event horizon, and therefore any radiation it releases will go out into the universe. And because it's uh, rotating around a fixed axis, there are these jets that come out. They're called relativistic jets, right? And the equations of um, physics can predict that that's what would happen if you have charges, particles going in a, a circle really quickly. Um, and it is the orientation of the, those jets and of the accretion disk to us here on Earth when we look at them that determines whether we label it as a radio galaxy, a quasar, or a blazar. So basically, if we're looking at the disk kind of sideways, then these jets aren't really shooting uh, energy towards us. But nonetheless, there's a lot of radio signal coming out of here, a lot of energy that is escaping in all directions. And so when we are looking at an uh, active galactic nuclei kind of sideways, we will identify that as a radio galaxy. We're like, oh, we're getting lots of more radio signals, but not concentrated and not a huge spike, just more than a normal galaxy, right? And that's coming from that active galactic nuclei, which is specifically a black hole's accretion disk, um, looking at it sideways, right? Now, if your, um, our angle relative to the accretion disk is such that the jet, one of the two jets, is kind of pointed in our direction, then we are going to receive a huge spike in energy because of the fringes. You know, this jet gets wider and wider as it goes farther and farther from the galaxy. And so we'll detect some of that really high intensity energy um, ray, um, electromagnetic radiation. And that's what we identify as a quasar, which, of course, because it's so loud and more common, um, was the first one. Uh, detected back in the 1950s. Now, if uh, one of them happens to be pointed more or less straight at us, then we get an even higher intensity. And because, of course, the angle uh, is wobbling and, of course, the spikes in the jets are getting stronger and weaker as the accretion disk grows or, you know, more matter is added or is lost, um, you know, that we, we get the blazar phenomenon, which is the higher intensity and the higher variability, right? So radio galaxies, quasars, and blazars are just three different ways of looking at the same thing, which is a black hole's accretion disk um, giving out enormous amounts of energy. And why are we seeing this mostly in faraway galaxies is because eventually uh, a black hole will uh, chomp, you know, all this matter will fall through as it loses energy, right? It decays to a lower orbit and eventually crosses over the event horizon. And then once all the matter is gone or escaped or whatever, then uh, the black hole is quiet, right? And so in the early days of the universe, it's thought these black holes, uh, the, their local area was more littered with stuff. Also, we think galactic collisions were a lot more common when the universe was smaller, right? And so all of those things would lead to uh, quasars, blazars, you know, basically active accretion disks occurring more, much more frequently in the early universe. And nowadays, of course, um, it's going to happen if two stars do collide. So, for instance, when the Andromeda and the Milky Way collide in four or five billion years or so, um, it is likely then that that will bring some matter close to um, the supermassive black holes in the center of those two galaxies, and maybe we'll get um, you know a quasar or blazar situation. Just depends on how much matter actually comes in close to those black holes and what kind of accretion disk gets formed and then, you know, how long it lasts is an open question, right, because it's mostly empty space. And as the universe gets older and things get farther and farther apart, which we'll talk about in the next unit, you know, we, we see these collisions as happening more and more rarely and therefore uh, fewer and fewer opportunities for forming the accretion disk that, um, that um, powers 
the active galactic nuclei. All right, just looking here to see if I missed anything. Okay, and I will uh, link these videos and it's learning for you to take a look. All right, and uh, that's your Fast and Furious tour of AGNs. Thanks for listening.